Hello Church, it's really good to be with you today at our online service, so a really warm welcome to you. My name is Kyle, I'm the student Canada pastor here at Stephen Hill. It's my joy and privilege uh, to welcome you to this church online experience. Whether it's your first time, whether it's your second time, whether it's your third time, whether it's your fourth time, whether it's your hundredth time, really warm welcome to you. And we're, we're really grateful to be together as one community. We love community, we love being together, we love people being together as one church. Um, and we just like to thank God for this privilege uh, to be here um, this, this afternoon, this morning. Let's just turn to God in some prayer before we get into some worship. Father, we thank you that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are kind. God, we thank you that you love each of us. God, we thank you that your love is great, it's divine. God, your love is just amazing. God, we see in the chorus of a, of a hymn here is love vast as the ocean. God, that your love is vast, it is wide, it is un it's, we can't understand your love. So God, we give you our hearts today, we give you our minds today, we give you our focus today. And God, we ask you to come and to be part of our number, to be part of our, our service this morning, God. Help us to be focused in your Holy Spirit. And God, we thank you that you are just a loving Father who loves your children so well. So God, we give you the service today, we give you our hearts today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Over to you, worship team. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, rejoice. Come, let's go. Come, let's go. Come, let's go. 
thank you so much worship team for leading us in a time of worship we really value you as a team we thank you for your service we thank you for uh, all that you bring to our church i just to bring some encouragement to you before we get into the message in john's gospel we see that jesus is describing the story of jesus as the good shepherd i am the good shepherd jesus says and he says in john 10 10 the thief comes to only steal kill and destroy but i've come they may have a life and life abundantly in the french verse says le voleur vient seulement pour voler tuer et détruire moi je suis venu pour que les gens aient la vie et pour que cette vie soit abondante and in the German version, it says, Der Dieb kommt, um zu stehlen, zu schlagen, zu verlichten. Ich aber bringe die Liebe und dies im Uferfluss. Just a bit of encouragement for you to believe that Jesus is bringing you abundant life, that he is abundant life for you. He wants you to walk in that abundant life. We're going to Pastor Pete, um, just going to continue our series on slowing down so that we can go further. And we're going to touch bases on the theme of Sabbath. What is Sabbath? What does it look like? And how can we apply the Sabbath in our daily life? team there for you as well if you have any questions or any prayer requests or anything you want to just talk about um, please reach out to the team we'll be looking forward to just hearing from you and to talk these things through with you so over to you pastor pete welcome to church online my name is pete pastor here at city on a hill and it's my joy to welcome each and every one of you to our online experience in a moment we're going to turn to the bible but before we do that let's pray and my hope is, um, whether this is a regular experience for you or whether this is your first time joining us, that you have an experience with God. The Bible is God's word and God always speaks as we turn to the Bible. We're in a series which we've called Slow Down, Go Further. And sometimes in life, trying harder, pushing harder, driving yourself more isn't what gets you to your destination quicker. In fact, sometimes it's the opposite. But actually learning to have right rhythms in life that makes life sustainable will enable you to go so much further personally and spiritually. So let's pray and ask that God will help us to comprehend some truths, to understand the Bible and teach us great things. So Father, thank you you're with us. Thank you you know and love each and every person that's connecting. And I pray help me to speak and help us to hear. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a story of um, two lumberjacks and, and they were chopping down trees and they went into the woods with a quota of logs that they had to chop down. And so, aware, very much aware of their quota, they start at work first thing in the morning, nine o'clock, they're chopping their trees. One of them's working over there, one of them's working over there and they're going for it, chopping down trees. Anyway, the bell rings. And that signals it's the middle of the morning coffee break. And one of them disappears off, has his coffee, and then reappears 10 minutes later and gets chopping in. The other one just keeps working right through his break. He's thinking, no, no, I can't stop. I've got to get my quota of logs. They keep going. Lunchtime comes, the bell rings. It signals lunchtime. Again, that guy disappears off and has his lunch. Reappears 40 minutes later. The other guy thinks, man, I can't stop. I've got to get my quota of logs. Keeps chopping the trees. Anyway, afternoon, bell rings. It's the middle of the afternoon coffee break. And that same guy disappears off, has his coffee. Reappears 10 minutes later. But the other guy thinks, man, I haven't had any breaks. I need to keep going and get my quota of logs. And the end of the day comes. The bell rings. And they finish their day's work. And then they tally up the number of logs they've chopped. And the guy who just worked through all his breaks discovered that he had cut, cut down far less logs than the other guy and he's scratching his head and saying how on earth did you cut down more logs than me you took all your breaks and the other guy said well when I was having my coffee and then when I went for my lunch and when I had my break in the afternoon I sat there had my coffee and I was sharpening my axe head and when I had my lunch I was sharpening my axe head and do you know what it's, a, it's an excellent lesson for life that in life it's not just the person that grafts and grafts and grafts that actually necessarily achieves more and the end of our lives isn't about how hard we worked but how smart and how well and how effective we were so come with me to the very beginning of the bible where we're interest, interest, introduced to some of the great concepts that affect all of our lives this is genesis chapter one
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and he called the darkness night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which there is their seed, each according to its own kind. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two lights, the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures. And let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. 
let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with the seed in its fruits. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, and everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Here we have this incredible account of the creation of the world written by Moses, the man of God. Some people wonder, well, how old is the earth according to scripture? And actually the age of the earth is ultimately a different question than the interpretation of what each day meant. Because before there was day one, God created the heavens and the earth, it seems in Genesis verses one, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And notice also, it says that God said, he created by speaking. It says, God said, let there be light. God said, let the waters teem with living creatures. God said, let the land produce living creatures. But notice when it came to the creation of mankind, it comes to, this is now Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. God didn't just speak mankind into being at a distance, as it were. God got personally involved. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth. He formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. When it came to us, God formed us. He didn't just speak at a distance. He formed us. He got his sleeves rolled up and was intricately involved. And between us and the human, uh, between us and the animal kingdom there is a vast difference god created the animals god created the plants god created the birds god created the fish but when it came to us the bible says in genesis 1 verse 27 god created mankind in his own image we are of a different order we've been created in the image of god that's how special you are as a human being and also notice in every day it was and God said it was good, Genesis, 21, uh, Genesis 1 verse 21. God said, and it was good. God said it was good. After each day, it was good. But when it came to the day when he created mankind, it says in Genesis 1 verse 31, and God saw what he had made, and it was very good. For God, the creation of mankind was the ultimate moment in his creation. It was the pinnacle of his creation. It's almost as if he set the stage and then onto the stage he brought mankind, created in his very image. Human beings, there is nothing more important to God than human beings. Uh, the, the philosopher and theologian, J.P. Morlin, uh, describes a discussion he had with his daughter one day. His daughter had been at school and it was Martin Luther King Day in America. And her, his daughter came home and she was saying, oh, dad, it was Martin Luther King Day. And he said, oh, what did you learn? 
And, and, she, and she quoted Martin Luther King. She said, we learned that all men are created equal in the sight of God. And uh, J.P. Moreland asked her, do you believe that? And she said, yeah, of course I do. And then J.P. Moreland went on to say, well, but what if there was no God? Would you still believe that? Would you still believe that humans have value? Would you still believe that we're equal if you took God out of the equation? And she hesitated and said, okay, I'm not sure. And then he said to his daughter, so let me take, and he took her into the living room and he pointed this painting, this well-known painting above the mantelpiece. And it was painted by quite a well-known artist. And he said, okay, here's a beautiful painting by a very skillful and well-known artist. And then he took her into the kitchen and on the kitchen table, there was a little doodle he'd done on a scrap of paper earlier that day. And he said, okay, just imagine, imagine there was a fire in our house. Which one would you run to rescue? Would you run and get the painting above the mantelpiece? Or would you run and get this, the doodle I did on the kitchen table? <clears throat> and she said, well, I guess I would go for the, the painting. And then JP Moreland went and said to his daughter, you know, it would be wrong to treat two things differently of different worth if they were equal. You, you, you think, okay, if, if they were equal, you've got to treat them equal, but you know they have different worth and therefore you should treat them with different worth. And then he continued and said, we have people in society, some of whom are criminals, they cause misery. Th then we have incredible citizens, they're generous. They're constantly giving back to society. And then you've got these criminals who take away from society and, and ruin people's lives. Now, if it was based on our performance, you would say that person is less valued than that person. So without God, there is no reason to treat these people equally. But only with God can you say that both the criminal and the contributors to society both have value, both have worth, because they've been created in the image of God. Human beings have intrinsic worth not because of their behaviour, but because they've been created in the image of God. And then the Bible says, God rested. It says in Genesis chapter two, verses one to three, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. And on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating he had done. We call this the Sabbath. And the word Sabbath actually originates from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to cease, to rest, or to desist. God created the world over six days. Each day was marked with, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Then there was evening, and there was morning the second day. But it's interesting when it comes to the seventh day, it does not have that phrase, there was evening and there was morning. And we're almost left with the conclusion that, well, maybe that day has just continued. Augustine suggested that God sanctified the seventh day and making an epic that extends on into eternity. Makes you ask the question, well, what does day mean in, in the book of Genesis? Was it a literal 24-hour day or a 12-hour day? Or was it metaphorical? And we can debate that a lot, and there's varying views within the Christian world. But what I would say this, I believe in the Bible. I believe it's the Word of God. So whether you take it as literal or metaphorical, I think as Bible-believing Christians, we have to conclude it's real. So for example, when Jesus said, I am the door, I mean, we know he was giving us a metaphor but it doesn't make it any less real. Jesus is the door. When Jesus said, uh, or it, when it says in the Old Testament, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth. I mean, it's not literal that eyes are flying around the earth. It's a metaphor, but we know it's real. We know that God is constantly looking at the hearts of human beings up and down the length and breadth of the world. So, Genesis, was it literal or was it metaphor when it uses the word day? Okay, we can debate that, but what we can agree is it was describing something real. God is the creator of everything alive and he did it in a sequence and he did it with order and he did it deliberately 
and human beings have been created in the image of God. And God rested on the seventh day, and that day doesn't have an end. We're left with the conclusion, maybe that day has continued until now. But then there was unrest on earth. Human beings rebelled against God. We fell, we rejected our creator. And actually ever since then, human beings have been trying to make ourselves our own gods. We want to be God. We want to be boss of our own life. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. And that was the very problem in Genesis chapter 3 where we rebelled against God. And at that point, rest left the earth. It says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 19, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. And it will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. From dust you are, and to dust you will return. Here we see spiritual unrest comes, and then it results in physical unrest. As soon as we detach from God, we detach from peace, we detach from health, we detach from life, and all of a sudden the world falls into chaos, thorns and thistles are there, by the sweat of our brow and eventually we will die. Augustine again speaking, he said this, you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. We were created for God and when that's out of sync, then everything else in life is out of sync. Our rest is found in God. But God didn't abandon the human race and as you go through the pages of the Old Testament, God found a people, they got, became known as the people of Israel. And he introduced to that people of Israel a covenant. And in that covenant, he introduced the Sabbath laws that every seventh day, they should also rest. Just like God rested, now they should also rest. And this actually wasn't just for their well-being. It was also a prophetic gesture. It was a shadow, you could say, of a future reality. A future reality where, again, this world that's in unrest, in some point in the future, would again enter into God's rest. Rest departed from earth, and God was prophesying that rest would again, at some point, return to earth. So God gave them Sabbath laws. He, he instructed them to have a weekly Sabbath day. Every seven years, they had to free slaves. Every seven times seven years was the year of Jubilee, every 50th year. And on that year, debts were forgiven, slaves were freed, land was returned, a year of liberation and restoration. But the ultimate rest comes when Jesus Christ comes. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus comes to restore what was lost. Jesus launched his public ministry on a Sabbath day. He stood up in the synagogue and he read aloud from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah saying, this was the time for the captives and the slaves to be freed. He said, I've come to declare the favorable year of the Lord. This was referring to the year of Jubilee, the year when slaves were freed, the ultimate rest had come. And he was proclaiming prophetically that Jesus' coming was about rest again coming on the earth. It says in, in, in one of his interactions with the religious leaders, Mark chapter three, verses one to six, it says another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hands, he stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. And then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus actually didn't do anything on the Sabbath. He spoke it. He said, stretch out your hand. <laughs> he didn't do anything. It meant that if they had a problem, they couldn't have a problem with Jesus. They had to have a problem with God himself, who is Jesus. Because Jesus didn't do anything. He didn't even touch the man. The man, you just said, you said, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched out his hand. Imagine seeing an incredible miracle and then going out, 
missing the whole point and going out and plotting against Jesus. Religious people are often the most unspiritual and the most far from God. Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Jesus said, He said to them, the Sabbath was made for the man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of rest. He came to restore rest on earth. The rest that was removed from earth when we sinned at the very beginning. That rest comes again through Jesus Christ. Like in Jesus' day, this whole concept of the Sabbath continues to be pretty controversial even in our day. For Jews, the Sabbath is a strict Saturday. You have Christian groups um, which are, aren't completely Christian in all their beliefs. For example, the Seventh-day Adventists, and they have a very legalistic, almost Jewish view of the Sabbath, and they believe that we've got to stick with the strict observance of the Saturday as a Sabbath. In fact, I remember I knew a uh, Seventh-day Adventist when I was a teenager. We, I had become a Christian, she was a Christian, and her, she was part of the Seventh-day Adventist church, and a true believer in Jesus. But as I got talking to her parents, they said, do you not realize that if you don't observe the Saturday as the Sabbath, that's actually, they believe that's the mark of the beast, because you're choosing, you know, on your forehead and your right hand, you're choosing with your decisions, and you're choosing with your hand to work, and you're choosing with your decision to work on the Saturday, which is God's holy day. So they literally observed the Jewish Sabbath law. Is that appropriate? Is that Christian? Are we meant to be literally a Saturday as a Sabbath? There are some very strict, um, here in Scotland, there are very strict traditions among Presbyterian churches, in some places, especially up in the Highlands, where they have such a strict view of the Sunday being the Sabbath, and you cannot work on the Sabbath, and the shops must be closed on the Sabbath. I remember growing up uh, as a kid, my, my dad and my family, we actually had a very strict view of the Sabbath. I grew up, I wasn't necessarily a follower of Jesus until I was 15, but I grew up in, in a home where we went to church every Sunday and my parents insisted that on Saturday, sorry, on Sunday, there could be no football, no seeing my friends, uh, basically no fun. <laughs> so uh, without them knowing, I, I would say, oh, do you mind if I go for a cycle ride? And they said, yeah, you can do that. So I'd cycle around and see my friends, and then I would sneak back. Um, yeah, but hey. But that's, the, that's what I grew up with. And is it right that today we have to observe a strict Sabbath? Is that appropriate anymore? Well, a fundamental shift has happened on earth. It is finished. In John chapter 19, verse 30, it says, when Jesus was on the cross, as he was breathing his last, it says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Teleo. That's what it is finished is in the Greek. It means to end, complete, conclude, accomplish, finish, pay, perform. When Jesus died on the cross, it is finished. What was finished? Well, his suffering was complete. But it wasn't just that. What was finished? The Father's will had been accomplished. What was finished? Over 300 Old Testament prophecies had been fulfilled in the life and the death of Jesus Christ and were about to be fulfilled in the resurrection. It is finished. What was finished? Satan was judged. It is finished. Salvation is now available. Hallelujah. You can be saved because it is finished. It is finished. The Old Covenant has ended the new covenant has begun. How do we know that's the case? Well, when he breathed his last, the Bible records that in the temple in Jerusalem, the veil was torn in two. What does that mean? It means in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, the way of approaching the very presence of God was in the Holy of Holies beyond a veil. And the veil was there to separate people from the very presence of God. And when Jesus died, that veil was torn from the top to the bottom. God did this. And it was signifying the reality that no longer can a select few, the high priests, once a year go into the very presence of God. No, no, all of, all of God's people. If you believe in Jesus, you have direct access through Jesus to the Father into a relationship that's eternal. The veil was torn to, the old covenant is over, the Jewish laws 
are no longer applicable in a legalistic sense. They're still wise. They're still the ultimate standard. But now God has written the laws on our heart. It says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first covenant, the first one, obsolete. Obsolete. There is a new covenant. Trying to approach God on the basis of the old covenant is like trying to go to a cash machine with a bank card that's that's out of date. It just just it's, it doesn't it doesn't get the same results anymore. Our approach to God now is on the basis and only on the basis of Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross in his death and in his resurrection. Hallelujah, through Jesus. We have a new covenant, a new arrangement, a new agreement with God. Paul writes to uh, the believers in Rome who were both Jewish and Gentile converts to Jesus. And this is what he says. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. In other words, Paul's saying, listen, if you're from a Jewish background and you want to strictly observe the Sabbath day on a Saturday, go for it. Do it with a clear conscience. Do it unto the Lord. But if you're from a Gentile background and you actually think, hey, we're no longer under the Jewish law, well, you have a clear conscience. You are free. You're no longer under the Jewish law. Live with a clear conscience. Be fully convinced. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, so don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only a shadow of the reality yet to come and Christ himself is that reality. So here's Paul saying, you shouldn't judge someone within, within a church context. Hey, if you've got a believer and they're not observing a Sabbath, you don't judge them for that. Why? Because that was just a shadow of the things to come. So. The seven-day Adventists who say, well, that's the mark of the beast to work on the Saturday. Well, it kind of doesn't line up with what Paul says in Colossians, that you're not to judge someone for not observing a Sabbath. He's saying that you're free from the law. And so it's no longer a requirement for us to observe legalistically a Sabbath on a Saturday, or for that matter, a Sabbath on any day. We're free from the law. Now, I'll come in a moment to the reality that it might be a good idea to have a Sabbath, but it's no longer... A legalistic requirement. Jesus is our rest. The Sabbath laws, the one day in seven that were insisted upon, was pointing to a reality of an ultimate rest that was coming in this world of unrest. Jesus is the one who brings that. He is Lord of the Sabbath. You see, in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant has discontinued. You see, the sacrifices stopped. No more animal sacrifices. Why? Well, because Jesus has become our ultimate sacrifice. The temple stopped being the temple, stop being the place of worship. Why? Because Jesus' body is the house of God. We, God's people, are the house of God. You see, the circumcision has ended. Wow, I'm glad about that one. And it ended, why? Because no longer do we enter into the reality of being God's people through circumcision. We enter into the reality of being God's people through repentance, faith, and baptism. And no longer is the Sabbath a legalistic requirement. Why? Because Jesus has become our Sabbath rest. You see, in creation, God finished his work of creation on the sixth day. That's the Friday. And then he rested on the Sabbath, which is the Saturday. God finished his work of salvation on the sixth day. When Jesus died on the sixth day, on the Friday, he said, it is finished. And then he rested, his body lay in the tomb on the Sabbath, on the Saturday, and then on the first day of the week, on the Sunday, Jesus resurrected. It was the first day. It represents the new creation. A new era had come. You know, many died having their work unfinished. Beethoven, it was said, died with an unfinished symphony by his side. The author Kipling died leaving an unfinished story, which he said it was going to be his best. The painter Raphael died leaving an unfinished painting of the transfiguration of Jesus. It bothered his friends so much that they carried the unfinished painting at the head of the funeral procession. The early church's attitude to, to the Sabbath was that the resurrection has happened. God's work is complete. Other people didn't finish their work, but 
Jesus has completed his work. Hallelujah. It is finished. The work was complete. The resurrection seals the deal. And the early church recognized this by making the first day of the week, that's the Sunday, the day of worship. It says in Acts 7 verse 20, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. And John writing in Revelation, Revelation 1 verse 10, he says, on the, on the Lord's day, that's referring to the Sunday, I was in the spirit. For God's people, when the resurrection happens, it really did change their whole calendar. It became, the, the Sunday became a day of worship. Now, it isn't the same as the Sabbath where it's a legalistic restriction day where you, you don't do any work. But the Sunday became the day of worship. In fact, it's one of the most powerful evidences for the resurrection. You, can't, you, you saw how legalistic the Jewish leaders were with Jesus. You have to observe the Sabbath. And yet thousands upon thousands of people who were Jewish became believers in Jesus and they changed their day of worship from the Saturday to the Sunday. Only the resurrection, only the mighty resurrection of Jesus could have been the thing that compelled Jewish people to abandon the Sabbath on the Saturday and embrace Sunday as a day of worship. 24-7 rest is what Jesus has come to give us. Jesus is your 24-7 Sabbath rest. Jesus said, Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. You see, this is not just one day a week, this is permanent. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus hasn't come to give you a day of rest. He's come to give you a life of rest. In the North Atlantic, you see these colossal icebergs, but actually above the water, sometimes they're quite small. But in reality, 90% of those icebergs are below the water line in the depths of the ocean. And you see these little icebergs and it's like the, blow, the winds are blowing, the waves are throwing around. Uh, boats would be thrown around in these stormy seas and yet the icebergs are just totally calm drifting along unmoved by the waves and the wind above the sur surface why because 90 percent of its mass is in the depths and if you as a person can have 90 percent of your life if you can be <laughs> in the depths with jesus your life is anchored deeply in relationship with god you've come to jesus and you've found rest for your soul then you'll find it doesn't mean that you'll necessarily have an easy life but it does mean that when the storms come you won't be as moved as you used to be. That in your soul is a deep calm and a rest because your rest is in Jesus. It says in Hebrews 4 verses 9 to 10, so there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. You see, when you come to Jesus, you rest from your labors. And that's not talking about necessarily your your job is talking about your religious labors. It's like you're trying without God. It's like you're trying to do life without God. It's like you're trying to religiously earn God's favor through your own hard work. You cannot labor to save yourself. You cannot be good enough to get to God. You, good works won't get you to heaven. We're not good enough. You see, when you, people train as lifeguards, they're taught that you can't save someone who's drowning until they stop trying to save themselves. Only then can you go in and actually rescue them. And you need to rest from your labors and instead rest in Jesus. It says in Romans chapter four and verse five, the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. The only kind of people that God justifies are ungodly people who don't work for their salvation. I can't save myself. I'm an ungodly man. I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. So instead, I've ceased my works. I've ceased my labors. And I rest instead in the finished work of Jesus on my behalf. And I want to encourage you today. You're maybe trying to save yourself. You're trying to earn God's favor. You can. Jesus earned it for you. Now rest in Jesus. Let him be your Sabbath rest. So now let me end with a one in seven rest. 
do we still need to observe legalistically a day of rest, a Sabbath? No. The Bible says the Old Testament, the, new co the Old Covenant came to an end and the New Covenant is here. You're no longer under that legalistic requirement. Would it be wise to have one day off in seven? Absolutely. That's really wise. I would encourage you, in fact, to retreat daily, rest weekly, and holiday annually. That's a good rhythm for life. And the one in seven principle actually is woven into the fabric of creation itself by God. It's interesting, in Leviticus 25, it talks about land Sabbaths. But even today, people who are experts in agriculture will tell you that you work the land for six years, and on the seventh year, you let the land rest, you let it lie fallow. And it's in that year that the land, the soil replenishes all its nutrients, which then make it even more productive in the six years that follow. So having a Sabbath for the land makes the land more productive. In zoos, apparently research has been done and found that when animals are in show for six days and then they have a day off, they do okay. But if they're on show for longer than six days a week, they don't do well. They start to wilt. The theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel said this, the Sabbath gives the world the energy it needs to go for another six days. Lynn Babb in her book said this, the Sabbath is a day to let go of perfectionism and let God run the universe. On that day, I will do my best to stop working and let God worry about what I am not doing right and rest in the joy of knowing him. Someone once said, Sabbath is a day when my work is done, even if it isn't. Take a day off. Why do you need a day off? Well, you'll be more productive if you're rested. It helps you live with margin. Margin is the space between you and your limit. And living with margin makes you more effective. It's like a computer. If your computer hard disk is full, it will not operate well. It stops functioning properly. You need to have margin in your hard disk and then it will function well. How do you know you're not living with margin? Well, you begin to begrudge others who are having a rest. You're constantly saying, I'm too busy. And you're easily irritated. When you've got margin, you've got space for spontaneity. Having one day off in seven makes life sustainable. You see, folks, this is not a 100 meter sprint. This is a marathon. You're gonna make this life sustainable. Having one day off in seven stops your work becoming an idol. It's you saying, I'm not gonna find my identity and my worth in my work. I'm gonna take a day off. Having one day off in seven creates time for other vital areas in life, for your marriage, for your family, for your hobbies. I remember one uh, pastor of a very large church in South Africa, he was asked, man, how do you cope with the busyness of ministry? And he said, I've learned to work hard and play hard. Having a day off in seven is a faith principle. It's a step of faith. It's like tithing. When I'm tithing, it's no longer a legalistic requirement for me, but it's a principle I live by. I love it, it's great. 10% of what I get, I give it away. And with great joy, I give it away, believing that the 90% that's left will actually go further if I give away the 10%. And I've found, praise God, that's exactly what happens. And it's the same with taking a Sabbath. It's saying, I'm gonna take one day off, believing that my other six days will be even more productive. It will help your physical and mental well-being having a day off in seven. Proverbs 14 verse 30 says, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. You'll have a better perspective when you're rested. Take a day off. Actually, you taking a day off a week, it's a prophecy. It's a prophetic prediction of a future era. Every time you take a day off, you are predicting and you're foretelling and you're foreshadowing in one sense the ultimate rest that's going to come in a world that is full of unrest. This unrest, this struggle, this suffering, this striving, this world of death and suffering will come to an end. The world will be restored. Rest will be restored on earth. Jesus Christ will return. Rest is restored in our souls 
but ultimately rest will be restored in reality. Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, you are the creator and you are the sustainer of our lives. I give praise to you, God, that you created and then you rested and you redeemed us on the cross and then you rested and you resurrected and you invite us to enter into your rest. God, we want to be people who are not frantic. We want to be people who are not living like life's a 100 meter sprint, but Lord, we want to be people who are paced. We want to be people who live with margin. We want to be people who are in this for the long haul. I pray, God, help us to have the wisdom to take a day off in seven. Let's take a moment to pray. Maybe your life's out of sync. Maybe, you're, maybe your life's out of sync because you've just been, work's been an idol. You haven't been living with margin. And actually, sometimes you've got to slow down to go further. Take a moment to make some decisions before God. For some of you, maybe your life's been out of sync because actually you've been legalistic, that you've been seeing the Sabbath as a legalistic requirement, but it's no longer a legalistic requirement. We now have Christ, he's our rest. And ultimately, hey, maybe you're joining today and you don't yet have that ultimate rest, which isn't physical rest, it's a soul rest. And Jesus said, come to me, Jesus said, if you're weary and heavy laden, and he will give you rest. Jesus died to save you from your sin, to take away the unrest and give you soul rest, ultimate rest, life transformation. And if that's you, I invite you to pray this prayer with me just now. Dear Lord God, say, dear Lord God, I'm so grateful for your love for me. Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross and thank you for rising again on the third day. I believe when you said it is finished, it is finished. Thank you, you accomplished salvation for me on the cross. And today I come to receive that salvation. I come as someone who is weary and heavy laden. Be my rest, change my soul, forgive my sins. God be my Father, Jesus be my Saviour, and Holy Spirit, fill me with your peace and presence. Thanks for hearing my prayer. I am now yours, God. Jesus be Lord of my life. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, let us know you made that decision. We want to do everything we can to help you grow in your faith. Hey, take a day off in seven. It will do you good. Don't do it legalistically. Do it knowing that Jesus is your Sabbath rest. God bless.
Thank you so much, Pastor Pete and the worship team for leading us. Um, we just love Sabbath, don't we? It's a day we can just rest, enjoy being in God's presence, just being with friends, being with family, enjoying that moment together. There's a resource online from um, John Mark Homer, Parts in the Way on the website, um, where it deals with the idea of solitude and Sabbath, the kind of practices you want to adopt as a church. We started a uh, small group series in August um, based on these practices. What is Sabbath? What is solitude? Um, after service at the moment, we're going to be together to have some Zoom coffee uh, on Zoom, um, just be able to be, be with each other, um, to talk about questions, to chat through things together as a community uh, online. And if you don't have a small group yet, please get in contact with us. We'd love to help you and to get you plugged into a small group, um, part of our community, part of our church. Um, that way we can grow together as a community, to grow together um, just spiritually and just as a community and family of believers. Twice a year we take time to pray and to fast and to lean into God's presence and to see what he, what was he saying to us. What's his heart for us? What's his vision for us? And this year we're going to have some time from the 1st of September to the 8th of September to take some time to pray and to fast. Here's a video from Paul to show us what, what will be included in this video in this week of prayer and fasting. Thanks Paul. Hi there, Pastor Paul and I've got a really exciting update to bring to you. The 1st to the 8th of September is going to be an outstanding, exciting and creative week. What's it about? I hear you ask. Let me tell you, it's going to be about prayer and fasting and you're going, no, oh, fasting. Listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus says as a follower of his prayer and fasting is part of his of the discipleship journey. It's a spiritual practice. It's life giving. It changes your heart. It brings you closer to God. It's something you really do not want to miss. And this year, we are going to have a prayer room dedicated to prayer. That will be 24 7, literally 24 7. Book in for a week, an hour, and somebody else then comes for the next hour. 
This will be in the diadem. The details will be on the website, but look out for it. This room, in my head, and my heart, I see this room like a sanctuary, a holy place. You will be there, you'll pray. Somebody will come up to you, they will be there, and they will pray. It's part of that week of prayer and fasting. I am so, so looking forward to this week. Jesus says prayer and fasting is key to the journey of following him. Let's do this together. Kids, youth, individuals, families, all of us together, praying in the room, praying outside of the room, praying together as a church, praying and fasting to see God work. I cannot wait for the first day of September. Join me. Thank you so much, Paul, for this video. We thank you for what you, br what you bring to our church. Um, so more information will be on our website um, for prayer and fasting week, what's happening, the dates and times, etc. So please keep um, keep look um, onto the websites and on the social media. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we thank you that you have joined us um, for this experience online. Um, and we just pray to bring our service to a close. Father, we thank you that you are calling us to rest. But you call us to rest, enjoy your presence, enjoy being with you, spend time with you. God, we thank you that you are a gracious Father, that we thank you that you are a loving Father. As we went this week, God, I pray, Lord, you help us, God, to stand firm in our faith. God, to read your word. God, to be inspired, to grow. God, to just to see our lives become more Christ-like. So, God, I thank you that you are you're just a good God, and we just celebrate um, your goodness today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week online, same time, same place. And um, thank you. Thank you. Bye.